Okay, um, this is the third video of chapter three. We're going to cover sections 5.3 and 5.4 uh, in this video. All right, so um, the first thing I want to talk about is the idea of independence. So independence is the idea that when one event occurs, it doesn't affect whether or not a different event occurs. So um, notationally, we say E and F are disjoint if the probability of E, uh, the outcome of E doesn't affect the probability of F. Now, this is not the same of disjoint. And in fact, it is impossible for disjoint events to be independent because if you roll a one, you clearly did not roll a three. So not only does your roll of a three care whether or not you rolled a one, you've literally forbidden it from happening because this other thing happened. So typically with a single event, uh, things can be disjoint, but with two events, we, things could be disjoint, but independence is normally much more uh, what we're worried about in that case. So um, for two independent events, we can just multiply them together. So finding that things are independent is actually very, very handy. So if we say, what's the probability we flip a coin and get heads twice? Well, we know the probability of getting heads once is half. The two coin flips, like they don't talk to each other, right? That would be weird. So the probability that you flip the coin twice and get heads both times is a half times a half, which is a quarter, okay? And again, the math is written out here, but it's really more of an intuitive idea. <clears throat> of course, you can have lots and lots of independent events. And again, independence is often a simplifying assumption that you make because it would be too hard to work out the math if you didn't do that. So for instance, here are three separate alarms um, and the probability that each one is set up is 95%. Could we work out the probability that, um, you know, um, any individual alarm goes off? Well, that's 95%. The probability that all three alarms will go off is 95 times 95 times 95. The probability that none of them go off, well, now that's going to be the complement. So if there's a 95% chance they do go off, the probability that none of them go off is 0.05 times 0.05 times 0.05. So again, three alarms would be better than one alarm if they're independent. The probability that at least one of those alarms will sound is going to be one minus that. So let's, let's work out the math of that since I went through that pretty quickly, right? The probability that one alarm will sound is 95%. The probability that all three of the alarms will sound is 95% to the third, which is 85%. So that's a pretty good probability. The probability that none of them will uh, sound, right? The complement of 95% is 5%. And then 0.05 to the three is this number here. What is that? One to the tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousand. So eight and 10,000. So that's a pretty unlikely event. So if you have three alarms, you're pretty sure at least one of them is going to go off. And one minus that is going to be the probability that at least one of the alarms will sound. So again, simple probability, but man, did that get pretty complicated pretty quickly, right? Again, you could do this math, but it starts to get a little trickier. Again, you can always use a calculator. Um, you could do this in StatCrunch. I think actually just a calculator app um, would be a better thing. I actually do the one on my phone whenever I need something like that to happen. Um, you could do it in Excel, which has the advantage that then you have a record of it if you need to do more math later. Okay, so the idea that if events are independent, you can multiply them through. Now, lots of things feel independent because, well, why would that thing influence the other thing? But it turns out that they aren't. Um, and so, this idea of checking whether or not something is independent is actually a super important thing later in statistics. So for instance, the 2008 um, housing crunch, um, one of the things that uh, caused the market to crash were these things called, uh, um, um, I just forgot what they're called, um, housing, uh, uh, housing investments. And so the idea was Right? If I loan you money to buy a house, that's a fairly risky thing because it depends on you being able to pay it back. And while I know you're a good person and you'll do your best to pay it back, there's some chance that you won't be able to do that. But if I took a thousand houses and we put all the money together and then we split it up and had lots of people invest in that, housing futures, that's what they're called, um, that seems like a much more uh, solid thing 
And if you assume that foreclosing on a mortgage or failing to pay your mortgage is an independent event, then the probability that lots of people will uh, lose their houses is actually pretty small. Well, what happened was in certain areas, uh, Las Vegas, San Diego, Florida, the price of houses went up very quickly and then it fell very quickly. And so this idea that you had part of a thousand mortgages, well, in San Diego, every house lost a third of its value in about six months. They weren't independent. So the assumption of independence was not very good at all. Um, right now, of course, we're thinking about uh, COVID vaccines and Right, this idea that, well, if I take multiple vaccines, gosh, isn't that going to protect me better? Well, if each vaccine works 95% and we take three of them, well, gosh, then I'm 99.98% covered if the vaccines are independent. And we know in some cases vaccines are independent because they work on different mechanisms, they do different things, but in other cases they will fail or work together, that either the vaccine will work triple or it won't work at all is actually more likely if the uh, vaccines are actually doing the same thing, that they're not independent. Anyway, let's do another example. So, um, for instance, um, here is some evidence from the Titanic. Um, so there were 2,200 people on board the Titanic and 1,500 people uh, died. Uh, we know that passengers were either called first class, second class, or steerage class. We call that third class sometimes, but right, junkie class. And then there were crew members. And we could work out the probability for each one of these separate. And if they're independent, we would think that the probability of each of these different groups surviving would be the same. However, if we go ahead and work through the math, what we find is that um, there is a 60% chance that uh, a first class passenger was saved, but there was only a 24.5% chance that a person in steerage was saved. So what that tells us is that knowing one event, which class they were in, changed the outcome that we had. So those two events are not uh, independent. So what we do in that case is we think about um, conditional probability. So conditional probability is the idea of not independence. That is, if we know something about it, which we use this little line here called given, given. that little vertical line there, it's above your uh, enter key on your keyboard. Um, so the probability of A given B is the probability that A occurs given that we know something else about it. We know whatever B is. So B is called the conditioning event and this idea that the probability of um, A given B can be calculated by the probability that both things happen divided by the probability that the second thing happens. Okay, so formula wise, again, now there's division involved and so it's still not very hard mathematics, but this idea that it's more complicated than before where we could just count up and multiply the probabilities together. So, if we look at eye color and uh, how people voted, this is uh, one of those uh, intro stat data sets uh, that somebody had. Um, we can work it through and say, you know, what's the probability of all of these different things? And the particular one is, are the events Republican and having brown eyes disjoint? So that would mean that the probability of having brown eyes for anyone is the same as the probability as it is for those who voted Republican. And we could work it through and we can say that they're not disjoint and we can further take it through and find the calculation for that. Now, the multiplication rule that we did before was um, just that we could multiply the probabilities together. But here, the multiplication rule for any two events, the probability of A and B is equal to now the probability of A given B times the probability of B. So, if the events are independent, then the probability of A given B is going to just be the probability of A, cancel, cancel. And so that means that the probability of A and B is just A times B. So we get back to that simpler rule that we had before under independence. Right, so there you go. The probability of A given B 
or the probability of B given A. It doesn't matter which way you do it. Usually our data has that it makes sense one way and not the other because that's the data we have. I'm gonna skip that one. So I'm gonna back up, that's what I'm gonna do. Here we go back to the Titanic data. So now we could just say the probability of A given B. So now we would say, well, the probability that a first class passenger was saved is the probability they were saved given they're in first class. And now we would say, well, instead of doing 706 divided by 2223, we would take that 199 out of 329. Now, this might sound kind of complicated to you, but it's literally the thing we did when we were doing the census example last week. That is when we would say, what's the probability that uh, a randomly selected person identified as white and compared that to the probability um, probably that a randomly selected person identified as white um, and they identified that they worked in agriculture, right, we could figure out those probabilities and these column percents are literally conditional probabilities. So that idea that we're going through thinking about um, how they work is actually pretty straightforward. Um, and this idea that, well, 2.63% of all workers identified as working in agriculture but for those who identified as black, only 0.79% of them worked in agriculture. <clears throat> well, that is now um, really different and that's a sign that there is in fact non-independence between identified race and identified profession. If the probabilities were the same going the whole way across, we would say that those were independent and you can see in the data here right, neither in columns nor in rows, are there really many professions at all where those proportions are exactly the same as the one at the end, either way. Right, over here, because 84% uh, of American workers identified as white, we see that these percents are typically closer to that, but that's more just a factor of them being a larger proportion of it. Okay, so that's conditional probability. Um, sometimes people talk about uh, two different uh, rules. Um, this idea that the multiplication rule for independent events is the probability of E and F is equal to E times probability that F and this fancier one with the conditional probability in it. But those are actually, there it is, right? They're actually the same rule because what's happening here is that this given isn't matter. It doesn't matter. So um, since the probability of E given F equals E, then the probability of E and F is just the two probabilities multiplied together. Now the book sort of implies that the multiplication rule is different than the, uh, the multiplication rule is different than uh, the conditional probability rule. But in fact, if you put this part of the equation over here, they're actually the exact same formula. Right, so this formula and this formula are the same formula. Okay, so that's section 5.4. All right, then we'll have one more of these.